be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Khan's conception of enlightenment seen through the movie Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. The very top of Great Britain's secret intelligence service, MI6, is the circus, the committee of the highest authority. However, it has been discovered that there is a mall inside this most secretive organization. To catch this mall who is tempering with the information of the most classified kind, the leader of the circus control comes up with a secret plan. In the midst of the Cold War, pushed aside by the US and ridiculed by the Soviets, control seems to suggest that it is time for the Great Britain, who had been battered and broken, got its things in order. The USSR had the disciplined citizenry and formidable military, and the US had the incredible economic power behind it. Perhaps the only thing of value that the UK could claim as their own was their brains that had withstood the fall of the British Empire. Be as wise as serpents and innocent as doves, the UK seems to be reluctant to give up on the notion that it is still the leader of the free world. In the midst of the Cold War, just as Control points out, nothing is genuine anymore. After the Second World War, all the international treaties have been nothing but ploys for economic gains and political treachery. Nothing was permanent and peace was only valid insofar as it served the parties involved. No genuine friend, no genuine enemy. In Perpetual Peace, Kant quoted Matthew chapter 10 verse 16 and said if politics is telling us to be as wise as serpent, such wisdom must be opposed by morality that proclaims that we must be as innocent as doves. Only when the wisdom is supplemented by sufficient innocence, perpetual peace may be possible. Kant argued that if the two cannot coexist within one commandment, in reality, the politics and morality would be in conflict with one another. The notion of friends and enemies can only be sustained when the politics can coexist with morality in an authentic manner, and the loss of this authenticity between the two would make the uncertainty dominate the friendship, which would plunge the politics into shameless graft for gains, with no principle. In a world where the innocence of the dove is lost, as Control would say, nothing is genuine anymore. In such a grim situation, one may even reminisce about the days of the war in nostalgia, saying something like, All my boys, all my lovely boys, that was a good time, George. It was the war, Connie. A real war. Englishmen could be proud then. To hold on to the semblance of a brain that maintains the world peace, the MI6 must smoke out this mall that threatens its innocence and eliminate it. Control assigns his right-hand man, Jim Prido, for this task in secret. However, Jim gets shut down and the mission ends in failure, and Control himself ends up resigning from the circus, taking responsibility for this embarrassment. As if to signify the end of the road of a great nation with a glorious past, Control passes away. The fall of the British Empire seems all but imminent. However, the MI6 that remembers the days of the glory did not wish to go down without a fight. Control's second-in-command, Smiley, becomes opponent for the mission of finding the mall. He begins his mission by seeking out the formal employees that had been released about the time of Control's departure. Control and Smiley represent the conviction that the world cannot be sustained without the brain. This echoes Kant's discourse on synthetic a priori judgment. Let's go over this concept briefly. Normally, we believe that we experience things and situations within the world, and such intuitions gained through experiences constitute our knowledge. Such view is often referred to as the empiricist worldview. However, according to Kant, there is more to knowledge than the empirical knowledge that we just described. Empirical knowledge only amounts to transforming subjective stimulus into objective perception and can only be a part of our knowledge of the world. It can never be equated with the whole of knowledge allowed to human beings. Instead, knowledge in the true sense of the word lies somewhere beyond our experiences. In other words, given before our experiences, a priori. The ultimate horizon of knowledge is not solely made of the intuitions gained through experiences, reformulated by the understanding in the name of the objective concepts. The notion of reason implies insatiable curiosity that reaches beyond the immediate experiences, and this insatiable curiosity leads us to imagine something permanent and universal. In that case, what is the nature of reason that makes us reach for the permanence and universality? Kant argued that the structure of our knowledge is given a priori, or prior to experience, and this structure organizes our knowledge a posteriori, after the experience. In other words, instead of experiencing something in order to gain knowledge of it, what makes experience possible is in fact knowledge. Kant's claim that formative reason comes before empirical information refers to the fact that knowing comes before living. Therefore, only when the brain that oversees knowing operates properly can one's life steer itself in the right direction. Knowing cannot be reduced to a means to becoming a cultured person. Being knowledgeable is in fact the precondition to living the life that one can find satisfying. For Kant, the world is something that can be seen only when it's known. 
Khan referred to gaining such knowledge of the world as the enlightenment. Enlightenment is man's release from his self-imposed immaturity. Immaturity is man's inability to make use of his understanding without direction from another. A man in such a state can never be free of the threat of emptiness and nihilism, even if he were to live a life with genuine passion. Unable to form his own knowledge, such a person relies on the existing order of the world and cannot claim to be a free being. For a human being to pursue the ultimate value, Kant suggests that we must dare to know and not to stay content in our self-imposed immaturity. Without the courage to use one's own reason, we may be left behind in the state of immaturity and alienated from the life of freedom. It is Kant's call to wake up from the slumber of ignorance in order to truly appreciate the value of life. Let's return to the movie. Smiley starts his mission by testing all the information that had been up until now simply assumed to be true. Because the familiarity established through repeated experiences what the mall is abusing in order to gain access into the circus. Let's talk about the inherent nature of the circus. The raison d'etat of the circus is in fact the very reason why the mall exists. MI6 is the organization that gathers knowledge that had been gained through experiences all over the world. However, the kind of information that Smiley needs in order to smoke out the mall is not the kind of information gathered by informants through their experiences. In fact, the hints gathered by Smiley give conflicting signal, since it is very difficult to guess the motive behind the mall's treasonous acts, given the prestige behind being a member of the circus. Belonging to the top echelon of the MI6 guarantees so much more power and wealth than a life in the USSR, so the mall's motive for treason is difficult to fathom. Furthermore, when it becomes revealed that Jim Prito is in fact alive, the search is plunged into an even bigger confusion. Leaving Jim Prito alive was a choice that risked exposing the mall's own identity, and this meant that the mall's motive was not just serving the USSR. Jim was arrested and tortured by the KGB and after being released was now living as a school teacher in the countryside. Jim is a very close friend of Bill, another member of the circus, and a close friend of Smiley. When Jim met a boy also named Bill at the school, he tries to give him confidence by telling him, What you good at? Nothing, sir. You're a good watcher though, eh? Us loners always are. Best watcher in the unit, Bill Roach is our best. As long as he's got his specs on, right? Yes, sir. In Jim's nostalgia and affection for Bill, we start to get a glimpse of their shared dream of perpetual peace. Jim's mission in life as a spy was to contribute to maintaining the peace of the free world and upholding the honor of the British Empire as the overseer of the world. In order to keep this memory alive, Jim talks to the boy Bill about keeping a lookout in contemplation. According to Kant, contemplation stands at the pinnacle of knowledge. It is the capacity of the enlightened subject to choose one's own path in life. The one who contemplates is someone who is in control of his own commandments. This is precisely what Control had dreamed of, and this dream is what Smiley tries to recover by finding them all. Of course, the contemplation that we engage in today is a little different from the contemplation that Kant had discussed. Our contemplation is similar to escape to fantasy, which amounts to an indifference to life. The reason why the word contemplation became corrupted in a sense is because the ultimate ideal of our lives have been eliminated. If contemplation becomes reduced to something pointless and harmful, what lies beyond the limits of our immediate knowledge also becomes reduced to an empty dream. In the world solely made of common sense, men lose their sense of freedom. Because they cannot see beyond the immediate circumstances, they cannot venture beyond them either. Jim's return becomes the key in the search for the mall. Because it is the mall who kept Jim alive, if the motive behind keeping him alive could be discovered, the identity of the mall would also be revealed. Smiley gets to accumulating hints surrounding the mall. In the end, he finds out about the secret house where the mall makes his rendezvous with a Soviet agent and catches him by luring him with false information. The identity of the mall comes as a shock to everyone. It is Jim's friend, Smiley's colleague, and one of the main brains of the circus, Bill. Bill had no reason to assume the role of a mall. He was a perfect British gentleman and a capable agent whose value was well recognized within the MI6. It seemed that he had no reason to pay his allegiance to Kremlin. However, Bill explains his motive to Smiley. I had to pick a side, George. It was an aesthetic choice as much as a moral one. And the West has become so very ugly. Don't you think? According to Bill, the West was no longer the free world where people freely contemplated the ultimate ideal beyond what is present at hand. The passion for enlightenment had died a long time ago, and efficiency based on analysis became the sole value that was pursued. In the West, freedom became reduced to the freedom to pursue gain with maximum efficiency, and together with that, man became nothing but a tool whose utility is to generate economic gains. Knowing all this, Bill had to make a choice, whether he would become the brain that would embrace the passion for freedom or resign to enjoying the watered-down freedom to enjoy oneself in the West. 
Bill was certain that he made the moral just an aesthetic choice. Bill wanted the world where knowledge led to freedom and freedom led to a better society. However, such a life was a romanticized version of society that he was facing, something that could only be dreamed perhaps in the world that had attained the perpetual peace. In the midst of the world of conflicting values, lofty ideals can only be taken advantage of by the powers that be. In a world where an innocent dove is no longer allowed to survive, wise brain cannot be tolerated within the system of the world order. In the end, Bill is assassinated by Jim Preto, with whom he shared his dream. The movie ends with Smiley returning to Circus reclaiming the brains of the MI6. But can we say that this is a happy ending? With no one left to believe in the power of knowledge to save the freedom of the world, can the existence of a covert spy organization be justified? Without the proper reverence for the ultimate ideals of this society, MI6 cannot avoid the fate of being reduced to a center for Asians who do their job out of their rational calculation for self gain. The movie does not venture beyond the limits of the common sense, but we cannot help but to challenge the ignorance behind it, which seems to suggest that we can do just fine without the reason guiding our way. At the end of the perpetual peace, Kant argues that possessing power inevitably corrupts the free judgment of the reason. In order to revel in the passion for progress that in fact must come before freedom and power, we must gain the courage necessary to make use of our own understanding. Rather than using knowledge as a tool, it is an attempt to apply knowledge to life. We must always pursue the seemingly impossible synthesis between life and knowledge. Bye. Paper Renaissance